Oh, hello. I'm uh, Jacob Lachman from uh, Audience Project, and uh, I'm going to talk about how you can uh, leverage tapping into first-party audience ecosystems uh, if you can do it in an open fashion. So we know a lot about the closed ecosystems from Google and Facebook and Amazon and others, but I'm going to talk about how the advantages is if you can tap into an open one. So, um, Audience Project is uh, oops, here. <laughs> yeah. Audience Project is a, it's a Danish company. We operate uh, in the four Nordic countries and in the UK, and we are looking into uh, Germany as well. And then we have an outlier in Vietnam for legacy reasons. Um, so our main business is uh, audience measurement, and we are the dominant tool in the Nordic market. So all media agencies, more or less, at least 95% of them, are using our tools to validate their online uh, di digital campaigns. We also tap into linear TV and we can combine the two numbers. Um, but I'm not going to talk about audience measurement at all, actually, uh, in this speak. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, the, is what we discovered when we, when we built our ecosystem underneath our measurement platform, was that, uh, that the ability to, uh, to tie uh, email, uh, ad identifiers, cookies, information to a profile that's a sustainable profile that doesn't have a massive churn, how we could use that in other cases than just measurement. It's great to have large numbers of, of uh, deterministic first-party data when you do measurement. It makes it very precise, but, uh, but we found out that you could use that to activate uh, other kinds of uh, data as well and tap into the consumer pathway using that. So, uh, to give a little more perspective on who we work with in the market, we are research partners for Google and Facebook which means that we're helping Google and Facebook validating their offerings in the Nordic markets. Um, we're official research partners for eMarketer, and uh, we won, which uh, we're pretty proud of. Uh, so I'm going to drag you a little with that. Uh, for the best audience measurement platform uh, at the Digital, Digiday Signal Awards, uh, which is a US prize, uh, I think that's quite interesting since we're a Danish company and have no business in the US. Um, we won that prize for a case with, the, with Facebook. Uh, and, and what we found was that, uh, that basically the number of profiles, of deterministic profiles we have in our panels, we have a more than 850,000 across the Nordics of real people that are live, that we've seen in the last three months. Uh, we found with that base, we can actually measure one-to-one -one more or less with Facebook. Uh, so, we, uh, so we submitted a case uh, talking about that. But uh, I'm going to show you a couple of cases of what uh, advantages you get when you, uh, when you can tap into a live ecosystem like that. So this first case is, uh, is a case for a Danish energy company. Uh, for those of you who are really interested, it's called uh, Nature Energy. Uh, it probably won't say anything for, for, for most of you. What's interesting is that they, had, uh, they have a pretty large, for Danish standard, uh, CRM database of, of 500,000 uh, in a country where you have a little more than 4 million uh, online. Uh, 500,000 is a big database, and if, if you can't use that database anymore, it's a massive problem. Uh, so we created a solution for them where we basically did uh, a fragmented pre-targeting flow uh, using banners, pre-rolls, uh, email messages, and did that cross-device um, based on their status in the CRM database. Um, and uh, So, what we basically did was we took the CRM database, we matched it with our live panel, and found the overlap. There was about 60% overlap, so it's uh, around 300,000 people we could see in our panel. We created a couple of segments, one house owner segment and one segment for, uh, yeah, for, for gas, for your stove and for heating in the house. Uh, those were the segments they were looking for. And then we started uh, a flow of exposure. So we found out through some tests that the, that the optimum exposure was a frequency of seven. So they saw seven different banner messages or, uh, or pre-roll messages based on uh, their status as, uh, in the CRM system. And uh, after they've seen those seven, we took them, uh, sent them with all the um, attributions to, uh, to Nature Energy so they could send out an email. Uh, and based on what they did in that email, they were met by their call center uh, with various different um, scripts. So 
depending on what their answer was, they would be, have a different conversation with the people uh, in the call center. And, uh, and this way of, of subtle uh, pre-targeting was actually shown to be really effective. That you basically show people some messages that are based on, on who they are before, uh, for, and what their, their interests are before you actually meet them. So uh, what we found was that uh, out of the, of the leads uh, that they saw before they couldn't use, uh, they had a 98% increase in conversion rates from the telemarketing scene. So that was uh, a massive uh, financial gain for them. Um, yeah. So I have a, one other thing that I, I'd like to share with you, which uh, is a very different uh, type of business. It's, uh, it's retail. So we've been thinking a lot about how could we actually connect uh, retail and uh, purchase in a physical retail store with online activity. Um, so the challenge from, uh, from this retailer, which is, uh, is the biggest uh, grocery chain in Denmark, uh, was how we could connect the, the physical shopping and tap into the consumer pathway uh, on the digital medias at scale and cross-device. And cross-device is super important here because a lot of the purchasing decisions around groceries is made from the mobile. Um, so uh, the solution we did was we used their loyalty club as a middle layer. So uh, creating a link between the offline purchase uh, behavior and, and the digital campaigns. So what happened uh, is uh, a person goes into the, into the store uh, buys uh, their shopping basket, there would be diapers, shampoo, washing powder, whatever in there. Uh, you swipe your payment card, and after that, you swipe your loyalty card. And about 65% of their users, uh, or loyalty card holders, which adds up to about a million Danes, they, they actually swipe that loyalty card. And after they swipe that, purchase data is added to the loyalty profile, the loyalty profile is matched to the live cookie panel, and all of a sudden, we have a link between uh, the media that they actually saw and what they put in their shopping basket. Um, so this means that we can actually now create uh, segments which are biased towards uh, shampoo or diapers or milk or something else, uh, regardless what it is. And we can also uh, go the other way so we can reverse it and see what did they buy in the shop uh, compared to which ad did they see. We can go both ways in the, in the funnel. Uh, and I can see that the, that the clock up here is now blinking and probably the music is going to start in a minute. <laughs> so uh, I will stop there and uh, I hope that uh, you found it interesting. Thank you. I think uh, all our speakers did a great job. Uh, it's a chance now for the audience to ask questions. Any questions? Maybe I can kick it off and hopefully there'll be some questions coming forth. All of you have shared great examples of the use of a customer journey or a consumer journey in targeting specific customers. My question is, based on your experience, what are some watch outs as you embrace this? What are some things that you really want to be careful about and avoid? Anybody? Do you want me? Okay, I'll start. Um, <laughs> um, for me, it's all about connectivity. It's all about being able, and I think Emma talked about it in her piece, it's about bridging the things and connecting things such that you have uh, a common target and a common audience that runs throughout everything you do. So much of what we see, the metrics for planning are just not comparable across different channels uh, in that process. Uh, and we feel very strongly that we need to build metrics that are common throughout. So you have programmatic, quite often completely disconnected uh, from regular uh, display advertising, disconnected again uh, from television. And you know, we, we think that if we're going to have this holistic view of this consumer journey, we're going to need to be able to have a system where we've got as many comparable metrics as we have across uh, that journey. Of course, you're going to bring in purchase data. Of course, you're going to bring in first party data, which, which might have biases in it. And we need to try to, to think about how we address that. But I think that would be the, the key for me is that we've still got a long way to go in creating those metrics. 
I was going to say, what, one of the things that we've found in all the work that we're trying to do, and hopefully I touched on this, is not to just use one data source to build a customer journey because that's actually really dangerous. And that's why I try to get across the point that actually there's strategic use as well as implementational use and that it's that combination of research plus actual data and the actual data bit and all of the different data sources that we've got is so important. And yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's not perfect, but we've got to be embracing it. And again, that's why coming back to the point I made about not just oversimplifying the customer journey from a linear perspective, because it is much more complex. And none of us have got the right answers, but I guess I'm just, you know, we're putting ourselves out there to say, let's all try and evolve this together, but it's going to be hard work. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the discussion of triggers, of psychological triggers that start journeys. We don't hear much about the uh, use of consumer survey work or the uh, motivations that, that begin all of this. It almost appears as if it, 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 it all shows up in the data. And so could you talk just a little bit more about the uh, operationalization of the concept of triggers in, in the whole process? Okay, well, I think f from us, for our point of view, one of the things we look at is consumers being out of market and then going into market. And we've done a lot of work around that. I mean, I showed a music example there of where the triggers are coming up, but we we're only getting that through um, research. So again, going back to the point that, that don't just use one data source to identify how to build a customer journey. We're only really understanding that um, through a research perspective in terms of the real sort of motivations of it. But what we're also trying to couple that with is looking at more standardized triggers that could have an impact, i.e. life stage, i.e. needs. Um, so we're trying to build that kind of rational and emotional bit together. But it is coming through in all of the work that we're doing. But it is, that's why we really still need research to build the consumer journey understanding. Thank you. I think. Uh Clearly, we are seeing that it's a powerful tool, but we have to watch out for good connectivity, a well-built uh, journey map based on multiple data sets, and uh, maybe we can do magic with all of that. So with that, I want to say thank you very much uh, for sharing your thoughts with the audience, and uh, give it back to RMC here.